Um, yeah, no, so very happy to see you all. Um, please ask whenever you don't understand anything. Um, maybe tough in this forum, but you know, the, the more interaction, the more fun it is. Also, um, I offered for Ross to do this second lecture. And one of the downsides is that it's therefore going to be quite long. Um, so if you, you know, if we decide we want to cut it short, we'll just cut it short altogether. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm not hurt. Um, all right. So I will first start to um, talk about fluorescence. And um, so fluorescence, um, ah, yeah, and I also, you know, with that, I want to point you to one resource that I've also been involved in in the past, and it's this eye biology online uh, microscopy course. It's actually a long series and a short series. Um, so that is an online research of, of videos of many um, great microscopists um, that is always available and that um, you know, I highly encourage you to look up things on and to also share with your colleagues that may not be as lucky to uh, join this course. So why do we like fluorescence? Um, and you see here- uh, sorry, in sorry to disturb, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I am Jan, by the way. Hi. Um, Hi Jan. In the previous slide, I could not read the, the internet address. I'm, I apologize. Maybe it was obscured. Is it too low for you? Yeah. No, I think the, the Zoom made it obscure. Thank you. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. It's also eye biology is the mm -hmm. search term that should always get you there. Um, so why do we like fluorescence? Well, one of the aspects you know, in normal microscopy, in transmitted light microscopy, we really put a lot of effort in generating contrast. When you just shine light through something thin, you don't see anything. And that's why we have phase contrast and DIC. Fluorescence, like you see here, you get high contrast almost for free. Then you can make it very specific. You can label very specific molecules in your cell and only see those and not others. So you can make different parts of your cell stand out. It can be highly quantitative. So you can really calibrate the system that if you have twice as much signal somewhere, that that really means you have twice the amount, the number of molecules there. And then what I really love is that um, it is live cell compatible. So here, this image that you see here of like chromosomes in red and uh, presumably microtubules in green is actually just um, a still from a movie, a movie of a dividing cell that forms a metaphase spindle and uh, goes all the way through forming two daughter nuclei. Now, um, so fluorescence is great, but what is it actually? And it's to me still surprising that it has been recognized, at least by science, for only, well, a little bit like 165 years or so. And it was described by various different scientists, but one of them was uh, this uh, Sir F John Frederick Herschel, who looks a little bit grumpy here. And he was studying uh, the medicinal effects of the bark of the Kinchona tree. And he held that up in his study against light that came through his top windows. And he saw that though perfectly transparent and colorless when held between the eye and, and the light or a white object, it yet exhibits in certain aspects and under certain incidences of the light an extremely vivid and beautiful celestial blue color, which from the circumstances of its occurrence would seem to originate in those strata which the light first penetrates the liquid. So um, now it is kind of fun to recreate this experiment. And um, I don't have bark of the Kinchona tree, um, but here, and I don't know if you can make uh, me full screen here or that I can, is that possible? Um, 
think if people can select the speaker view. Ah, that's yeah, cool. so, so, um, so we don't have bark of the Kinshona tree. No, little too little light. Okay, oh, too much. Is that okay? But I have here this um, this tonic water from the local supermarket, and I have a um, UV laser that uh, gives a blue light out. And so when I now hold this up to the tonic water you see that it gives this beautiful celestial blue light. And this is actually way better than what uh, Sir Herschel ever saw, because we light this up like crazy. If we, we can do a control experiment with water just to be sure. And you see that in water, this does not happen. So we have an, a huge amount of fluorescence coming from the quinine, which is the active component in that Kinshona bark. Um, uh, and that and that quinine is is present in uh, in tonic water. So so now we've seen it. Um, so how do we best think about it? Well, so what we saw is that we were exciting with this UV light, this uh, laser in my case, or the sunlight in Sir Herschel's case. It excited this molecule, uh, the quinine, and the quinine then emitted light of a longer wavelength. And that is kind of the general idea. The emission is of longer wavelength than the excitation light. And of course, there will be exceptions, which we may get to or not, but that, that is the general role, rule. And so when we then think about uh, the physics of this, what is happening is that that molecule has um, a ground state. Electrons in that ground state, so the molecule absorbs this light of low wavelength, high energy, and um, gets into an excited state. Basically, electrons get picked in higher valence bands. That process happens very, very fast. It happens on the time scale of uh, femtoseconds. And I find it very hard to think about these uh, kind of big numbers. But when you think about how, if you translate that into the distance that light travels during this time point, light travels 0.3 microns. So this is a super fast process. The um, electrons hang out here for a bit, but quickly relax to the bottom state of the uh, excited state. Uh, through a process called internal conversion, a little bit of heat is dissipated. That happens on the order of 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So light would still only travel less than a millimeter during that time period. And then it hangs out for, in comparison, in eternity. So uh, we go now to the scale of nanoseconds, uh, often a few nanoseconds. So here it says 10 nanoseconds. And light would travel on the order of three meters uh, during that time period. Now, uh, then uh, at that point, it actually uh, falls back to the ground state and emits um, a photon uh, of a higher wavelength, lower energy, because all this energy that was lost in that internal conversion and, and whatnot has to, um, is gone, and so that means that the wavelength of this photon will be higher than the wavelength of the photon that was excited. Now, it not always does have a happy ending like this. The energy can also be transferred to other molecules, actually interesting processes that can be happened and detected that way. Um, and so that means that, that a useful number is the quantum efficiency. So what is the ratio on average of absorbed and emitted photons? And you know, for a good dye, you like that to be very high, 100% or QE of one, but in reality it's lower and it will also depend on the environment of the molecule. There's also a relation between the lifetime and the quantum efficiency. And so, um, Basically, the longer something stays in the excited state, the more chances there are 
but it gives off energy to other processes. And so the longer that excited state, the, the uh, you know, it, you could expect that the lower the quantum efficiency is, although these things can also be work the other way around because if a molecule in the excited states tends to give its energy to something else, it will have a lower lifetime and a lower quantum efficiency as well. And then another useful feature is the brightness, which is kind of a combination of how effective a, a, a molecule, a fluorescent dye absorbs light and how effective it um, uh, gives it off. So it's uh, determined by both the absorption coefficient and the quantum efficiency. Spectra are very useful with dyes and those basically are spectra of how well it absorbs the light or better how well it absorbs light that actually results in fluorescence emission, which is the, uh, the, the kind of uh, dotted line here. And then the emission spectrum itself. So here you excite somewhere at a certain wavelength, and then you measure the spectrum of the light that is emitted. And whenever we do microscopy, we think about the spectra of the dyes because you, know, you kind of need that to determine your filters and to do the planning of the experiments. There is, um, uh, we talk about excitation maxima and emission maxima, which is kind of, you know, shorthand for the spectra to make it easy to think about these dyes. And there's um, technical terms like the Stokes shift. Stokes was also in, um, in an old uh, a British scientist from the 19th century, which is the difference between the excitation and emission spectrum. There are many different types. And so we're kind of now switching from physics to chemistry. And there are very many different types of fluorescent dyes. There are only um, a few that we actually very often use, but it is still in those, and I'm going to talk today only about these organic dyes and fluorescent proteins. But there, you know, you have to be aware that there are a lot more that under certain circumstances can be very useful. So like these quantum dots made with semiconductor uh, technology, uh, phycobilly proteins, uh, lanthanides, little metal nanoclusters, carbon nanotubes, and all of these people have done very cool things with. So don't forget them, keep them in the back of your mind. So first organic dyes. And, you know, there was a whole push uh, to synthesize these things in the, uh, the end of the 19th century. So probably with the uh, uh, recognizing quinine and creating uh, multiple dyes and so things like coumarin, which is kind of like quinine, it's kind of um, uh, also UV excitable. Fluorescein um, can be synthesized in huge quantities. It's highly fluorescent. Rhodamine, rhodamine is still relatively useful because it's relatively photostable. And what you see here, which kind of makes sense, is that all these uh, dyes have systems of conjugated bonds that share electrons. So, you know, to be in the wavelength of light, you need a relatively large system of shared electrons to create um, um, the possibility to, uh, to absorb uh, visible light and to get into an excited state. And you see also that the more to the red you go, kind of the larger that system of conjugated bonds becomes which also means that in general, these dyes uh, that go towards the uh, IR tends to be very large and hydrophobic. And it indeed is kind of difficult to make them, um, to make those things water soluble. Now we don't use most of these much anymore. And that is because of photo bleaching. So photo bleaching is a bit of an uh, uh, annoying effect. And that is that when you excite something, that after a while it stops working. So uh, after uh, a certain number of photons have been pumped out, these dyes uh, die 
they stop fluorescing and it doesn't come back, at least most of the time. Um, and so basically this means that each molecule will emit only a certain number of photons. Now that is uh, annoying um, and it pays to think a little bit about what is happening. And one of the main processes is that once we're in the excited state, there is a certain chance that the spin of that excited electron will uh, invert. And that spin inversion will result in the so-called so triplet state. And from that triplet state, um, there it is quantum mechanically, it is, it is forbidden according to quantum mechanics to actually um, fall back to the ground state. So that means that the triplet state is extremely long lived. Now, like anything quantum mechanically forbidden, it just basically means that the chance of it happening is very low. And so that means that it will happen, but like on the order of, of milliseconds or seconds sometimes. And so um, the triplet state is also what underlies. So usually we call this phosphorescence. So if only after a very long time, we get emission of a photon, we call it phosphorescence rather than fluorescence. And so that triplet state is dark. It takes these molecules out of the cycling and we don't see these until they relax and go back. But what is even worse is that from the triplet state, what often happens is a reaction with, uh, for instance, molecular oxygen that creates a singlet oxygen radical. This thing is super reactive and will often just attack the fluorescent dye itself and which then will be broken up in pieces and is no longer fluorescent. So uh, you can use this and you can use photo bleaching in general uh, by things like, uh, uh, well, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching or um, here this chromophore assisted light inactivation where we use a dye to locally generate a lot of singlet oxygen to locally destroy the protein that is bound to so that we can locally study the function of that protein. And like a lot of this uh, physics, you know, there are always interesting ways to exploit it. Just to be aware, there's a lot more complicated physics going on. So from these excited states, also re-excitations are possible. And here you see um, a study, I think with rhodamine, where all these different energy levels were mapped out. Uh, and there's all kinds of interesting photophysics going on that, you, you know, who knows one day we can do all kinds of interesting things with. Now in practice, what can you do about bleaching? Um, select good dyes, so don't use fluorescein because it will bleach fast, but use newer alternatives, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Just use a lot of label. If you, um, uh, every dye has a certain chance to bleach, if you start out with a lot, you also end up with a lot more. You can decrease bleaching by changing the chemical environment of the dye, and so uh, you know, if you have fixed cells, you use these anti-fade mounting media that often uh, increase um, viscosity, which decreases photo bleaching. And I still don't fully understand why, but that's definitely true. You can use oxygen scavengers, so enzymatic systems that take the oxygen out of the uh, environment. We also use that a lot in uh, biophysical experiments. Um, uh, you can use free radical scavengers and triplet state quenchers. So additives that, um, you know, quench the triplet state or, or take away those radicals that were uh, produced by the triplet state. And there's now, um, you know, there, even dyes have been synthesized that themselves include these free radical scavengers. So to locally scavenge. Um, you Definitely what in practice is super important, and that is, you know, it, it should become second nature when you start working with fluorescence, is you want to use every photon that you have. So only open the shutter when you're actually looking, 
when you're not looking or, or measuring through a microscope, make sure there's no light actually hitting the sample because it's bleaching while you're not using your um, data well. Uh, use a uh, minimal exposure time, minimal excitation power, good filters, the best camera you can afford, and a very simple light path that does not um, absorb any unnecessary light. Now those dyes, so since the days of coumarin and fluorescein, we have moved on um, uh, oh, that's to dyes like the, the cyanin dyes. I think those became popular in the 1980s, 1990s. Company Molecular Probes, then out of Oregon, developed this whole Alexa dye series, which I, where that Alexa is actually not uh, me, does not mean a chemical structure, but it's just a commercial name for a whole series that are all named after the excitation center, uh, excitation maximum. Um, and so more recently, Luke Lavers at Genelia Research Campus, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Research Campus um, in Virginia, has been uh, kind of taking over the specter of the chemicals fluorescent dye synthesis and has uh, developed a whole series of very uh, stable and very nice dyes with all kinds of interesting properties that they have been sharing very freely to everyone who, um, who asks for them. Those are called the Genelia dyes. Um, then we have dyes, but we still don't do anything useful with them. So, and that's kind of what I mean here with the word probe. So to convert a dye into a probe, we need to do something. Sometimes we actually don't need to do anything because that uh, small dye itself uh, has a propensity to bind to certain biological compounds. So for instance, this mitotracker that uh, can enter the cell, uh, enter mitochondria, where it gets oxidized so that it doesn't leave is fluorescent. So it's a very easy compound to label uh, mitochondria in live cells. There are various colors of it available from molecular probes or now I think they're in uh, Fisher. In, I don't know. I don't can't keep up with those companies. Um, things like DNA dyes that intercalate often in the minor groove. Things like DAPI, various Hoax dyes or these bivalent Toto yo-yo dyes developed by molecular probes. Um, so they will, um, some of them can enter the cell, but definitely once the cell is broken open, they will intercalate in the DNA and uh, light DNA up. But oftentimes you don't have anything like that and you need to create a chemical bond between your dye and your protein of interest. Now, the first type of chemistry that's most obvious is to target um, amino groups in your protein. So every protein has uh, quite a few of them. There's always lysines around. And so you can use a succinimidyl ester or an isothiocyanate that is conjugated to your dye and to do a very easy room temperature um, uh, in water coupling, basically just mixing these things, make sure there are no primary amino groups in your buffer or your dye will react with those. And that's how, um, you know, and you can then label, for instance, small molecules, things like phalloidin and taxol that label uh, actin filaments and microtubule filaments. Um, you can label proteins and a special case of proteins are antibodies. Um, and I'll get back to that in a little bit. So in our lab, for instance, we use this to um, label um, uh, tubulin, and we then uh, polymerize the tubulin into fluorescently labeled microtubules. And we use that in this so-called gliding assay, where we put a immobilize a molecular motor, in this case, dynein, on the glass surface, let it be active. There are all these heads standing up and then grabbing on, on the microtubules. And then uh, it will move these microtubule filaments along the glass. And so this is a very quick way to look for uh, motor protein uh, activity. 
that kind of looks very fascinating as well. Um, and that is uh, amino group labeling of uh, microtubules. Now, you can label proteins directly, but if you then um, um, want to look what that does or where it is located in a live cell, you would need to um, micro-inject it, micro-inject that fluorescent labeled protein in a cell. And that's definitely still uh, an option, although not widely used anymore. If you fix an open cell, you could have your, an antibody that you generated against your protein of interest. And you can then fluorescently label that antibody so that you see where the antibody lights up your antigen of interest in a cell. This works, but it's not fun to label every antibody that you generate. And so what often happens is that we use commercially available secondary antibodies. So for instance, if your yellow antibody that you made, if that was a uh, rabbit polyclonal, you then use a goat anti-rabbit antibody that was generated in goats by injecting those goats with rabbits and then isolating the serum uh, with re uh, rabbit um, uh, immunoglobulin and then isolating the serum and having that fluorescently, the goat anti-rabbit fluorescently labeled, you now bind that to the goat antibody on your antigen of interest and you build up this little tree that not only amplifies the signal because there's more fluorescence here now, but also you can buy this thing, you don't have to make it, so it's easier to, uh, to do this. And that's called indirect immunofluorescence. Um, there are, you know, we're not happy with just lysine labeling. Often we want to know exactly, and it's especially true in single molecule work, but also for many other types of experiments, we want to know exactly where uh, we label a protein of interest. And so one attempt to do this is to use cysteines. Proteins often have only a few cysteines. If you're lucky, there's only one or you can even generate a mutated protein so that it has only one cysteine and then you can use melamide chemistry to label it there. Um, in the late 1990s, Roger Chen's lab came up with kind of a variation on this where they made a small cysteine rich peptide that conjugated to this arsenic compound. So a fluorescent dye that had two arsenic uh, arsenide uh, atoms conjugated to it that would then bind to this uh, small peptide. So now you add this little peptide to a protein of interest and then this dye will label it and will label it only there. Now, so this is not that widely used anymore since it's the dyes are not super specific, but this same idea has been extensively um, um, has really flourished with these things like SnapTag, ClipTag, HaloTag. So these are small genetic tags of like, in the case of a SnapTag, about 20 kilodaltons that you attach to your protein of interest. And then there is a dye that is um, uh, preferably cell permeable that will bind that tag. It's off, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. That often will uh, so these, these tags often are uh, mutated enzymes that will stop in the middle of their um, uh, catalysis cycle, will have a covalent bond to this um, small molecule. It cannot proceed. So this thing is stuck and it's covalently bound. So uh, using these tags and adding these dyes, you get covalently labeled protein. Um, so halo tag is very popular in our lab, but also things like YBBR tab, uh, tag developed in Alice's Ting's lab uh, are very common and there may be more than listed here, but you know, these things are super useful for, pro for in vivo protein labeling. Um, now a small word about single molecule imaging. We, we do this in the lab a lot. So here you see again, a dynein protein that has been labeled with 
rhodamine. And you see now the, uh, the track has been immobilized on the glass and the motor is now moving along the track. And you, know, you see that this actually works, but it may also be clear that these are very noisy images. We are not densely sampling in time. So in general, there's not that much information that we can get out of these before these dyes photobleach. And so you can use things like quantum dots, but quantum dots are very large and in quickly interfere with protein function. And a student in our lab, Stefan Niekamp and I were kind of contemplating what we could do about this. And, you know, we were going back to like, first thing to do uh, when you have a bleaching problem is to bring as many dyes together as you can. And we were thinking about ways of sticking multiple uh, dyes together in a small space and attaching to the protein. And Stefan came up with this idea of making uh, of folding a few small oligonucleotide in these, what we now call fluoro cubes. So you buy these oligos with labels uh, at the end, you fold it very much like origami in this, four, this small cube, about four nanometers on each side. And as a bonus, you even attach a biotin to it so that you can easily um, uh, attach it to using this uh, streptavidin biotin chemistry. And, um, you know, to our kind of, we expected this thing because it has six dyes to be six times as bright, but that was not the case. So presumably because these dyes are close by, they kind of quench each other. Um, but instead is what you see here, they were roughly the same intensity, but bleaching was way delayed. So here you see a single dye bleach in like, uh, you know, seconds, whereas that six dye fluorocube, you know, could last like 50, times longer. And then when we uh, labeled single motors with it, we were able to get these, uh, and this, in this case, I think it's kinesin motor. You can resolve this single stepping. So eight nanometer steps while it is moving on microtubules. Imagine eight nanometers with a light microscope. And, you know, this is something that could be gotten with a single die but the traces that we got were more like this. So we were just looking at a blow up of this trace here. So we could like follow for like 10 minutes with nanometer resolution, the stepping of this uh, uh, motor protein just by putting more dyes on it on one specific site, but uh, with this small or uh, DNA origamis. So this goes to show that there's still like all kinds of creative things possible with fluorescence and fluorescence molecules. Fluorescent proteins. Um, now I don't wanna dwell on this too much. Um, the story of the discovery of fluorescent proteins is a wonderful story. Um, uh, Shimomura, uh, uh, you know, it's a wonderful story of just being curious about nature, you know, these, these scientists who in the 70s, 80s, 90s were just curious about this bioluminescence and dare to, you know, spend lots and lots of time in figuring out what was going on. So Shimomura actually isolated the uh, green fluorescent protein from this uh, jellyfish Aquora Victoria. It's very cool to see that jellyfish, by the way, and put it on our UV lamp. Um, he isolated uh, GFP crystals and already figured out a whole lot about the chemistry. It then was um, Doug Pressure, who uh, in Woods Hole, who, who had the idea, you know, if I clone this thing and express it, it may actually fluoresce by itself without uh, needing a cofactor. Uh, his grand ran out before he could finish his work, and it was. Um, Martin Chalfi and Roger Chen, who really continue that work, and they won the Nobel Prize. That pressure actually, so Roger Chen offered him a job in his lab before Roger Chen himself passed away. And I think that that's where Doug ended up. Um, 
TFP is the most uh, studied and most mutated protein ever, likely. So this is from just 2004, all kinds of different variants, some of which we still use, or definitely you know, mutants or derivatives of these things. Um, some of the red shifted ones were actually isolated from other uh, organisms like corals. Also beautiful stories how those things were discovered. I encourage you to, uh, to read up those things. They're just nice stories of scientific discovery and you know what fun it is to just be curious and try things out. One thing I do want to mention here is that um, some of these fluorescent proteins will change their characteristics when you shine light on them. And that was already the case with the very original, uh, what's called um, the very original GFP, the wild type GFP. So when the, the excitation spectrum of wild type GFP here in the top left is a big peak at four or five nanometers and a smaller peak at 488. And so researchers liked the 488 excitation because we used it for fluorescing. So you're at, everyone already had the light source for that. But when you shine four or five light on it, after a while, the 488 excitation goes up and the 405 goes down. So it changes conformation um, so that you get like more 488 excitation. Now this PA GFP is basically a wild type GFP where that initial 488 excitation has been mutated out so that you have only 405 excitation and it is dark upon 488. And then once you shine 405 light on it or 400 roughly, it switches and it now is excitable uh, with uh, 488 blue light. And so this thing can go on and off. And this is actually something that if I understand correctly, it was first recognized with fluorescent proteins. Later also uh, organic dyes were made that do the same things, but it's super useful. There's a whole families of these things now. Some of them switch colors, others uh, uh, are reversibly switchable. And so there's lots of creative things that you can do with these fluorescent proteins. Now, um, super useful, constructs have been made by you know, designing these fluorescent proteins so that they sense certain um, uh, cellular aspects. So there are sensors for uh, activated G, uh, GTPs, guanine uh, binding proteins. Um, a super useful sensor is this uh, GCAMP family, which was uh, already published in 2001. Uh, by Nakai and uh, in the Emoto group, where they uh, used a circular uh, GFP. So they fused the C and N terminus and broke it open somewhere in the middle end of the barrel. And they inserted their calmodulin fused to the M13 protein, um, which I think is from the myosin light chain. And so the idea was like, you know, when calcium binds calcium, modulin, this thing will change conformation and will change fluorescence. And that indeed worked and worked on first try and well, not first try, but they, they got a working version in 2001. This GCAMP, as they called it, has been also mutated in all kinds of variants with high and low calcium sensitivity. The speed of the response has been mutated. And you know, one of the uh, coolest examples um, that I'm aware of, of, of what you can do with this is this imaging of a whole zebrafish brain that is expressing GCAMP. And you can kind of see, oops, oh, you can see the activity of the neurons in here. You can see the um, uh, activity firing. By the way, this is, so this is from Philip Keller's lab at Genelia Research Institute, also with a very cool microscopy system with a uh, so-called light sheet microscope. But you know, when I saw this first, it was blown away to kind of see thinking in action, although we still haven't figured out what that zebrafish is thinking actually. Um, okay, so that brings us to how 
what do we do to a microscope to actually see this fluorescence? Um, here we have a simple upright microscope. This is actually the, the normal light source here in the bottom. Transmitted light goes through the objective to the eyepiece or the camera. Now for fluorescence, you can throw away the, that whole bottom part, or if you have an inverted microscope, the whole top part. You don't need illumination there. It's all happening here. So the important thing is blown up here, and that is that fluorescent cube. So we have a, uh, a fluorescent, we have a light source uh, for epifluorescence. In the old days, it was a very bright white light source. We now replace that often with LEDs or lasers. Then this cube has an uh, excitation filter that filters out the light that we want to excite with. There is a di dichroic uh, mirror that, that reflects down the excitation light. The object starts fluorescing. The objective picks that up back up. That fluorescence is longer wavelength, passes through the dichroic, and is emitted as fluorescence. Um, so again, these filters, sorry, I have to close the door to get the cat out. Those filters have spectra. And so when you look at the spectrum, the excitation filter will transmit low wavelength light, the dichroic filter will reflect low wavelength light. It, the dichroic filter will transmit this higher wavelength light and the emission filter will uh, again also transmit that. And so these filters are the key to, fluor to seeing fluorescence. So it pays to think a little bit about how they work. And um, you know, in a way, a nice analogy is the soap bubble. So soap bubbles have a thin uh, membrane um, of soap, a mixture of soap and water. That's about the thickness uh, is getting close to that of the wavelength of the light. It's a semi-transparent layer, but there is um, a reflection um, both in the top and bottom layer, and that those two uh, beams of light interfere with each other. And so depending on the distance between those two layers, you get either reflect, uh, uh, destructive interference resulting in re uh, 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 reflection, or you get uh, constructive interference, in, and that will result in transmission. And so these filters have been completely designed with these semi-reflective coatings and multiple layers of them to reflect the light you want to be reflected and to transmit the light that you want transmitted. And the manufacturers and the um, physics there has gotten so good that these can be literally computer designed to do almost anything. They are generated by, by uh, uh, these coding machines on, on pieces of glass. And you know, it's an underappreciated part of the revolution in fluorescence microscopy, but filters are key at that. We use terms like bandpass filter for this emission filter or long pass. So this one passes everything longer than something. You know, all terms in the end doesn't really matter. We want to know the spectra of this. We want to match the spectra of our filters to our fluorophores. And this used to be pretty difficult, but uh, this guy, Kelly Lambert at Harvard, designed, um, he started together with Kurt Thorne, I think, a long time ago, but he really uh, took this to new heights, uh, a website called FPBase. And there he has databases of dye spectra and databases of filters. Most commercial filters are all in it. And you can even you know, construct your own microscope. So this is from our, what we call our super scope. And you can match here your uh, excitation filter with your uh, emission filter uh, and even put in the camera and the, the quantum efficiency of the camera. And it will calculate for you, okay, in this case, we get 54% of the emission of our fluorophore we get back, which is actually pretty good because you see it's, it's very hard to uh, get anywhere near 100%.
So definitely check this out and use this fpebase.org as a resource. Now, um, often we don't want to be switching, you know, to switch between fluorophores, there are multiple things we can do. And, and often we don't want to have too many moving parts. So we either use lasers or LEDs that we can switch very, very fast. And so here we go from blue lights that excites the specimen and emits green light to yellow light that then excites the specimen and gives red fluorescence. And now you may say, but hey, wait a second. How does this dichroic uh, uh, pass ref uh, both green, uh, reflect yellow and pass red? That is crooked. And it is indeed crooked, but it turns out that these manufacturers of the filters have gotten so good that they can make these multi band pass dichroics and emission filters. And so this is kind of the standard thing that we have in most of our microscopes. So it has been optimized for a 405, 488, 561 and 640 laser. And then has you know, look at how good these filters have gotten. They are all like 95% transmission in their bandpass regions. And the big advantage of this is that you don't need to move anything and you can switch extremely fast and so collect data much faster. And that is where I want to leave this. Um, I do need to call out Kurt, Kurt Thorne. Uh, who is no longer working in microscopy, but still close by and a good friend of mine, uh, Bo Wang, professor here at UCSF, also uh, contributed to parts of this lecture. And the um, Mats Gustafsson, a great guy who regretfully passed away um, now many years ago. And here are some um, resources that still may be of interest in. Um, you know, uh, I would like to solicit uh, questions from you at this point in time. <laughs>